Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country. Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted, award-winning coffee at GotYourSixCoffee.com. I recently had the honor and privilege of speaking with retired Army National Guard Master Sergeant Crystal Romero. Crystal held various positions in the Army throughout her career, starting with logistics, then on to public affairs as a photographer and journalist. The majority of Crystal's career was with the New Mexico Counter-Narcotics Task Force and running operations for the 64th Weapons of Mass Destruction Civil Support Team, which was activated and responded to the Space Shuttle Columbia recovery efforts in 2003. Her final years in the military, she was a platoon sergeant, sexual assault victim advocate, member of the Safety Council, and ran the Joint Substance Abuse Program for the entire state of New Mexico. Crystal obtained degrees and certifications in business, communication, graphic design, and analytical chemistry. Her federal and state accreditation certifications include fiscal law, hazmat tech for industry one and two, geographic information systems, hazard prediction, and assessment capability, certifications from NARAC, the National Support and Resource Center for Emergency Planning, and many others through Defense Threat Reduction Agency. She has a Reserve Overseas Service Ribbon, four Navy Achievement Medals, three Army Commendation Medals, and one meritorious service medal just to highlight a few it was a privilege hearing how crystal has committed her life to ensuring that honorable service members experience the security and safety they need and deserve as they serve our country her heart to serve men and women in uniform who are currently facing the issues of sexual violence drug and alcohol abuse and suicide and many other difficulties are a tremendous credit to her as she continues to serve our nation by serving them Crystal, welcome to Get Up Nation. Um, tell me where you currently live and work. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am retired. So right now I'm just a full-time activist. Amazing. All right. And this activism comes from some pretty painful experiences. So, um, you know, any anything that you want to share uh is it's totally up to you if there's anything that is too troubling uh, for you that you don't want to get into we can we can dial it back from there um, just want to kind of hear what you experienced you you made the noble and honorable choice of serving our country and unfortunately a series of events happened where um, people didn't treat you as honorably as as you should have been treated and so I want to kind of get into that experience because I think it's not just a few people that this happens to. I think a larger, um, I think this happens more than we'd like to admit. And, uh, and so I'd really like to hear from you on, you know, what, what your experience was, um, some of the keys um, of helping you get through that time for anybody listening who may be experiencing a similar experience. Um, and I just want to kind of give people, you know, you know, some insight into how we can prevent this from happening, um, how people who live with honor and integrity can, um, be, live an honorable life and, and serve honorably, truly, uh, by valuing every person um, in, their, in their chain of command and by not, you know, participating in the stigma of, of mental illness um, and recognizing the wholeness of the people that go to war, that oftentimes there are injuries and wounds that aren't visibly seen, um, that uh, we need to care for each other as people, um, throughout the process of our service. So if you'd like to start here, let's, let's talk about your service and what you experienced. Well, I, um, I joined the military when I was 17 and, uh, I came from, uh, I came from poverty basically. And I was actually a foster kid. And when I was emancipated, I enlisted. It had been actually my childhood dream because my, my godfather, my padrino, was a baton death march survivor. 
Wow. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to grad, you know, to grow up listening to his stories. Um, wow. He passed away when I was 22 years old. So right before I made my E5. Mm. So, you know, I was, I was, I was very blessed to have him as guidance for me um, throughout, you know, the, the early portion of my career. Um, but um, I served in um, many different capacities. I started in logistics and then I went into photography and journalism for a little while. And then um, from there, I went into um, this weapons of mass destruction civil support team, which is an active duty, an active duty unit. Every state has one. Um, and I simultaneously, while working on the weapons of mass destruction unit, I, I worked with the counter drug task force here in New Mexico, which is the, um, the counter drug uh, program is, is, is a huge asset to New Mexico because it's, it assists uh, the DEA, ICE, the FBI, Border Patrol, uh, you know, state, the DEA, I mean, many different uh, state entities. And uh, I worked there for nine years as well. I, in 2010, I was appointed as the substance abuse uh, program co coordinator for the state of New Mexico. And I was also on the safety council. I was a platoon sergeant and I was also the victim advocate for the one, the whole entire brigade. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is about at the time, uh, I don't even know how many, maybe 1500 soldiers, wow. maybe more. And um, so in 2012, you know, I was already two years into my job as the substance abuse coordinator. And um, I was also a national evaluator. I was on the national evaluation team for the counter drug program. And I identified some issues that were going on in my state. And I you know, went to my chain of command and, and, and I said, Hey, I need some support with this. You know, I've got a coworker who's, she wasn't doing her job like at all. <laughs> and her job was very important. You know, she, she wasn't like an admin person, just, you know, filing papers. Cause you know, I mean, there's, you know, there, there is, there's lazy people out there. We get it. But her, her job was to get soldiers into treatment and, um, you know, into rehabilitation for drug and alcohol abuse. And um, I had a young lady. Um, I mean, I had, I had soldiers that would self refer to me all the time because, you know, one, I was, you know, I was a platoon sergeant. So they, a lot of my soldiers, they could, they, they could talk to me. Um, you know, they, they didn't have any issues talking to me. And so I was able to use my position, you know, to get them, into treatment without any repercussion. Um, Cause that's what the self-referral program in the military is for. You know, you say, if you're having trouble, you come to us and we're going to help you. And um, I had a female who had been sexually assaulted and came to me because she didn't tell me about her sexual assault right away. It was in the conversation with her. Um, she's like, you know, well, I, become addicted to heroin and methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, I was just, just talking with her, you know, like what's going on with you. And finally she just broke down, she just broke down. And she was like, I was assaulted and, but I don't want to file a report. She was terrified. She was absolutely terrified to fi file a report. And, um, you know, after talking with her and um, hearing her story and going through everything with her, I can absolutely understand why. Mm -hmm. And so, I was able to use, again, use my position to get her into treatment. And that way she, while she's in treatment, she can talk about why she's not doing drugs, you know, but it, cause this is civilian, you know, they go off into civilian treatment facilities. So um, I was able to get her enrolled and then I, you know, I let the unit know. And a month later she tested positive again. Again, so I, I went to my coworker and I said, "What, what, like, what's going on with this, with this, with this, with the soldier? Like, why aren't you following up?" And 
she said, oh, she's a lost cause. And, and that just absolutely infuriated me because you don't get to make that decision. Right. You know what I mean? It's it, when you're dealing with people who have experienced trauma, yeah. you, you know, that, which is one of the reasons why it was so important for her to learn how to do her job and get certified in her job so that she can understand that this is a position of trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because someone doesn't call you back doesn't mean they're the lost cause they might be going through something. They might be struggling. They might need some extra assistance, you know, something, something's going on. They've already come to us and identified a problem. Right. So now it's up to us to get them the treatment. And I just wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't getting any support. And so I went to, you know, and I, and I was pretty patient in the beginning, you know, I mean, five months went by and she still hadn't been certified in her job, trained, like still didn't know what she was doing, didn't even know how to do her job. So I went to my, to our boss, who was a colonel. And I said, sir, um, you know what? She's been in this job for five months. She has not been certified. And if you're not going to require her to get certified and do her job, then I'd like to request that she be moved somewhere else and get, you know, I want, I need somebody in that position. Cause I actually oversaw her. And, um, and he said, nope, he said, nope. He says, I will caution you. He says, she is the daughter of a three-star retired general. Her brother is the chief of staff and her other brother is your brigade command sergeant major. So I would take caution, Sergeant Romero, and where you want to take this. I see. And the only thing, the only thing that I could think at that time was what does her relationship to anybody have anything to do with have anything to do with anything else? Like, what does it have to do with the fact that soldiers need care yeah. and that soldiers are falling through the cracks, yeah. you know? And, uh, and he said, you know, well, if you want to roll the dice and you want to challenge her family, go for it. And, uh, he had recommended I file an EO complaint. So I did, I went and filed the EO complaint, you know, and they were like, well, what's your complaint? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm required to do my job. Why is she not required to do hers? you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was told, Oh, it's not a valid EO complaint. And when I filed the EO complaint, it went, it spread like wildfire, right? Now it's, Oh, Sergeant Romero's, uh, trying to get so-and-so in trouble. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like, now it looks like I'm harassing her. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know what? We were both senior NCOs, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, if she was anybody else, yeah. I would have, I would have had them moved, you know, I would have, I would have counseled them and I would have had them moved or, or I would have got them trained and right. we wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be here today, Ben. Right. Right. <laughs> I would be at 23 years of service, right. probably any nine kicking ass, Yeah, right. but that wasn't the case, you know? So, um, so my chain of command, this they is failed it. to support me. And, and this is in an organization that, that prides itself on leaving no one behind. Am I correct? Like it's part of the, mm -hmm. it's part of the, you know, yep. as, as people choose to serve that, you know, it's the warrior ethos. Yeah. The warrior ethos that you leave no one behind. So somebody needed, needed help and they were being left behind. You advocated for them, which is part of your responsibility as an NCO, as a senior NCO. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then what happened then? And then it just all went uh, downhill from there. Um, my command pulled my support staff. So now I was working alone, uh, which, you know, pretty much like isolated me. So now I'm, I'm working alone. I'm doing the job of three people. I'm still doing her job because, you know, I'm not going to take a backseat to this. And so I continued to, you know, to try to help soldiers get the care that they needed. And, um, my, my command just, they created this occupational phenomenon where they pulled my support staff and then they loaded more work on me. And then where they would reprimand me because I wasn't working fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And, um, I was exhausted. I was absolutely exhausted. I was teaching. I was, um, you know, I still had my, 
you know, my additional duties. I, you know, I was on the safety council. I was teaching. I, st I was in charge of the drug testing program. So I had to initiate the tests. I had to mail out the tests, you know, I had, to, and then I had to receive them and I get and got them back and I had to do quality control on each specimen. You know, this is hundreds yeah. of, um, of drug testing samples that I had to QC. I had to do the quality control on. So I was, I was exhausted. I was exhausted. I was getting no command support at all. I was constantly emailing them saying, I need command support. I need administrative support. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. what's going on? Right. And my command just flat out lying to me, mm -hmm. like lying to my face, telling me, oh yeah, we're going to get you some support. Yeah. When this whole time they're creating this occupational phenomenon and um, and, and not providing any support at all. Right. And then, um, and just, you know, humiliation, you know, like they started just, um, just doing everything to discredit me. Mm -hmm. You know, they st started digging into my personal life and all this other stuff. And, uh, finally I got to a point where I was just, I was exhausted. I felt very defeated. Um, I had, I'd, you know, I'd reached out to my command several times and asked him, you know, like, why isn't, why, why does nobody want to help me right now? Like, what is going on? And, you know, they're like, you, you don't fuck with the general's daughter. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's, I don't know. I, at the time, you know, when I was going through all this, it made no sense to me because it's like, just move her. You know what I mean? Just move her, move her somewhere else. Get me someone that, that, you know, wants to work yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and problem solved, but it, it, and then it didn't, it didn't work out that way. So, uh, one afternoon I was in my office and, uh, her dad walked in the building and made his presence known, you know, her, her office was right next door to mine and he's a three star. He's a flag officer. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's protocols, a flag officer, you know, when they arrive at a military facility, there's a, a flag has to be put out and somebody has to meet them at the door. That's the protocol. Nope. He walked right in, looked right at me, went into her office. They were in there a few minutes. They walked out. And when they walked out and they walked past in front of my office, she looked at me kind of like a snarky little, like, you know, kind of like that, uh, it's just yep. intimidation, yep. you know, it was intimidation kind of mm -hmm. like, yeah, let me remind you who I am. Yep. And, uh, at that point I was like, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely ridiculous because in the meantime, soldiers are not getting into their, into rehab. Right. Right. So, um, so I, I, at that point I kind of just had a breakdown, you know, this is, this is months of going through this stuff. And, um, I was exhausted. I was working long hours and um, we were getting ready for an evaluation by National Guard Bureau. And um, a month before our evaluation, um, I'm sorry, no, no, not a month before. In December, December 2nd of 2011, I'll never forget this day, I, I had reached my breaking point and I self referred myself to. Uh, a psychiatric hospital here in Albuquerque mm -hmm. for suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I, I felt so defeated. I felt so defeated that here I was doing my job, you know, taking care of soldiers mm -hmm. and my command was not supporting me at all or supporting the soldiers, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, in, you know, and all the while creating this occupational phenomenon and just, I was exhausted so I was admitted for, you know, exhaustion, depression, suicidal ideation, and hostile work environment. And I was in the hospital for, um, for three days. And when I got out of the hospital, you know, I went on convalescent leave for a while. And I had to, while I was on convalescent leave, I was informed that my boss, the colonel, was relieved by the chief of staff, which was her brother. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he got relieved. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It's like Crystal went to the hospital. My boss got relieved. Mm-hmm. When I got out, um, I was told to report to my new chain of command, which was a female colonel and a male colonel, um, the joint chief of staff. And, um, you know, I thought, you know what? It's a female colonel. You know, maybe, maybe this is my saving grace. Like I'll talk to her. I'll tell her, Hey, um, you know, ma'am, this is what's going on. You know, we had a face-to-face meeting, you know, fresh out of the psych hospital. And I said, um, you know, that this is what's going on. I don't have any command support. They've pulled my support staff. I, I'm, I've got a lot to do. You know, I've just come off convalescent leave, so I'm going to have a lot to catch up on. So, um, and, you know, and she looked me dead in my face and was like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get you some help. And, um, days later, the chief came in the, in my office and he said, oh, uh, per, uh, the Colonel, the female, the drug testing program is suspended. And I was, uh, a little confused cause I'm you know, like, you don't have the authority to do that. That's the department of defense drug testing program. You know what I mean? By it's. It's a federally mandated program. Uh, You don't have the authority to do that. But I mean, you know, it's my, it's my command. So what am I? So I was like, okay, all right. What can you do? So for, so we had a evaluator come down a month later in March to do an evaluation only to substantiate everything that I was saying. You know, I had um, my counterpart, her, her job, she was the prevention treatment outreach coordinator. She had seven hours of training for hours. She had seven. And the evaluators, you know, in their assessment, they said that, you know, it was in the assessment. Command needs a better understanding of the program. Command needs to support the program. And, um, you know, due to the drug testing program being suspended, this, the whole state was in non-compliance. And the issue with that is that it's a safety concern right. because the drug testing program exists for a reason. Right. You know, you don't want soldiers that are high on methamphetamines on the gun range. That's right. Okay. Or behind the wheel of a Humvee right. on the roads mm-hmm. or working on an aircraft. Right. We're operating an aircraft. Right. There's a reason why we have this program. And so suspending it and having no drug testing um, in the state for a period of about five months was a huge safety concern. That was a huge safety concern. And um, when, I, you know, when I brought that to the attention of, of National Guard Bureau, I was relieved I was relieved three days after the the, the National uh, Guard Bureau came down and did an evaluation. So that basically right there was the derailing of my career. So they relieved me from my active duty position and they reassigned me to a position that didn't exist. Right. And then two weeks later, they're like, there's no funding for this new position we put you in. So we have to let you go. And, um, I just, I didn't even, you know, I felt, I felt so defeated, you know, and one of the reasons, um, it was so hard for me to just, to accept that is because of everything that I overcame in my life to Mm -hmm. get where I had gotten, Mm -hmm. you know, I was a hardworking NCO. I was very well decorated. I had a very, I had a stellar career. I mean, I was doing great things. You know, I had one of the top five drug testing programs in this, the nation, you know, I mean, for my command to just turn their backs on me, uh, Ben, you know what, for me, it was the betrayal. It was the betrayal. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't believe that nobody would help me. And they knew that my mental health was deteriorating at a rapid pace. <laughs> it seemed like they encouraged that. They knew. 
sounds like they were intentionally taking actions that would create uh, increased stress when you're already dealing with, you know, these challenges. It sounds like it was pretty intentional from, from. Oh, I'm very thinking. intentional. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, you know, I got out of the hospital and had a face to face meeting with two colonels telling them why I just got out of the hospital. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and then they just continued to push right. and to do things, you know, I mean, um, during the evaluation, you know, there was, there was some things identified during the evaluation and um, I went to the, to the uh, commander and I said, uh, sir, these, this is not, this is not accurate. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he says, well, don't point anything out don't point anything out. And I'm like, I don't need to point it out. Like they're going to find it. They're going to, I mean, they're evaluators and I was an evaluator. So I knew yeah. I'm like, they're, we need to address this. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't point anything out. So when the evaluators came through and did their evaluation, of course they found everything. And um, after the evaluators left our state, he pulled me into his office and he reprimanded me. And he told me that I was the most unprofessional NCO he had ever met. And he did this in front of another E9 because I wouldn't lie right. during the evaluation. Because you were serving with honor. I'm like, you're not going to compromise my integrity because you guys are screwing up. You know what I mean? It's like, and not only that, but it's like, what's wrong with taking your, your L? You know what I mean? It's like, you, yeah. you, you guys screwed up. Yeah. So... It's, it's, it's one point off of your evaluation. You know, you're not going to, the whole program's not going to come crumbling down. It's just, you're identifying a problem. You're identifying your indiscrepancies. And so, you know, as leaders, we're never going to learn if we don't, okay, we have a, a we, it's broken or we screwed up. Right. Let's fix it and move on, you know, and that was, that was the problem. So, so I was relieved status. So I was no longer active duty and they referred me for a mental health evaluation because I was, I was experiencing suicidal ideation and they started immediately started the process to med board me out. I mean, none of those soldiers got into care. My, so my, the service member that um, was assaulted I was able to get her into a treatment facility, but because no, but because I got removed from that position, I couldn't track her anymore. So she fell through the cracks. She got no, she ended up not completing her treatment. And, um, and every army and air national guard soldier in the state of New Mexico was put at risk. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was, told that I was being, you know, released from active duty. Um, it just, I, that was my rock bottom, yep. you know, I had overcome a lot of things in my life, but for me, that was, I, again, it's, it was the betrayal, you know, it's like, wow, I have worked my ass off for you guys for 16 years yep. and, and you guys, None of them were there for me. None of them. They all turned their back. And so in April of 2012, um, I was hospitalized again because this time I actually attempted. And I called, um, I called up one of my battle buddies and I, and I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I was just, I was so, I was depressed. I was really depressed. I was really down. I felt so betrayed. I felt so alone. You know, I was humiliated. You know, they, when I got out of the hospital the first time, they passed around my psychiatric records and had discussions about my treatment. You know, that's a HIPAA violation. Yeah. But apparently in the military, just because you wear a uniform, you're exempt from everything. If you're a military officer, you can do whatever you want. So, you know, I was just facing humiliation, you know, demoralization, ostracization, everything. And um, I just, 
I called up my friend and I said, I'm done. Like, I'm done. Like, my career's over. Um, you know, everything that I've worked for, it's gone. Like, it's gone. I'm getting kicked out. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I called him is, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, when you, it's called a buddy check or, you know, you call your bad buddy is because I didn't want my children to find me. So, um, I, I didn't, that's how, that's how, that's how bad it got. And now moving forward, you know, for a long time, I carried that shame. I carried that shame of, Oh my God, I almost abandoned my children. And that was hard for me to overcome too, because, you know, it's, it's been, um, it's been eight years since, you know, since that happened and it's been, uh, six years because I attempted again in 2014 when I got my official retirement orders, mm -hmm. I was like, it was like official but that was also a turning point for me. Okay. This is where the story gets better. Mm -hmm. So we get, so we get into the better stuff is that, um, in August of 2014, I attempted and obviously wasn't successful, <laughs> but I woke up two days later in the hospital with this, just a whole new realization. Like, what are you doing, Crystal? Like you've been through so much shit in your life. Like, are you kidding like what's wrong like what are you doing you survived so much you know i survived my childhood literally survived my childhood you know i survived foster care mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's like um i i thought you know what there's you have to you got to do something you know you've got kids you you can't abandon them I was feeling abandoned by my family, which was the military. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what am I doing now? I'm just abandoning my family. Nice. So you need to, you know, get your shit together. Like we got, got to work on this. So I did, I started, um, working with a trauma therapist, nice. um, weekly and, um, working past the, just the hurt, the pain, the betrayal, the feelings, uh, the anger, you know, uh, when I filed my complaint with the Department of Defense, they ensured me that they were doing an extensive investigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ben, I just two, uh, I'm sorry, just a week ago received my FOIA, my, a copy of my investigation. It took six years for the Department of Defense to get me my investigation okay so i just reviewed it and there was no investigation there was no investigation it was a 153 page document and it was 130 pages of me doing an interview me submitting supporting documents me submitting memorandums um, supporting i mean everything i was giving them everything and they did not interview anybody. They sent out a few emails asking a couple of questions <laughs> to which general officers lied, like just straight lied. You know, one of the questions that was asked in the, in the email was, um, Oh, like, you know, just to the, um, to the female Colonel who actually made her one star during my investigation. Uh, they asked, you know, were, were you, did, did you oversee the drug testing program? And her response was no. <laughs> I was okay. Um, but in my investigation, also in the, in the report is a news article from when she made her one star in, in 2012. And in the bio of the article, it says, as the joint chief of staff, so-and-so oversaw the drug testing, sexual assault, suicide prevention. It's in the, it's in the bio. Yeah. So, you know, like there's no justice. Yeah. There's no justice. You know what I mean? It's like, and I was 
isn't even the victim, Ben. That's what makes it the, like, yeah. you know, I like I was the advocate. Yeah, you were the advocate. <laughs> Not even the person that you were trying to get the help. You were doing what was right for someone who was in need. You were taking care of your soldier. Like, like you were told to. Yeah, like I was trained to yeah. and like I was told to. Yeah. And um, so now where I'm at now is I'm on this mission because you know what? They can't take anything away from me anymore. They can't take my career. Yeah. You know, they've already taken that away. I am fighting it. I have, I have asked for my investigation to be reopened and I'm going to push it nice. because um, you know, I'm, I, my goal is to go before, you know, the armed forces um, subcommittee and say, you, uh, Congress is constantly saying, why do we have so many veteran suicides? Right. Well, let's talk about it. You know, my, my case is, my case is a one-stop trauma shop because yeah. my case deals with suicide, yeah. sexual assault, yeah. drug and alcohol abuse mm -hmm. and abuse of authority. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it all, it all comes down to that. So, so that's my goal. My goal is to, you know, I'm pushing and I'm advocating for, for veterans um, that are just dealing with, especially the, with, with military sexual trauma. Um, the I.M. Vanessa Guillen Act is going to provide a, a, third, a third party, you know, an outside source for service members to report uh, sexual assault. Excuse me, sexual assault. And that's just a step in the right direction you right. know that's not going to solve the problem right. it's not going to solve the problem but i know for a fact that if people start being held accountable you know that's going to be kind of like the deterrent yeah. you know because it's you know fortunately the way that people are recruited you know it's like recruiters go out like whale sharks right and they just open their mouths yeah. and they just take it everything in yeah. and sometimes the bad ones get filtered out, but some slip through. And you know what? This is where command needs to start um, being held accountable for not addressing those issues. Yeah. You know, when, when there's a, a service member who's been identified as like, you know, like a creepy dude or a creepy girl or whatever the case, like there's signs, okay? Yeah. Yeah. There's signs everywhere and people, talk especially women you know women will warn well, we warn each other yeah you know i mean especially like women who have been deployed right. you know right. i've i've interviewed many women who have been who have been deployed and you know they say yeah when, when we get in in theater the first thing we do is we like we all talk like okay who do we need to watch out for i mean that should not be part of your job part of your job should not be like, like having meetings with all your you know with your yeah. battle buddies saying all right who's the rapist yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean it's like and then also bystander complicity yeah. that shit needs to stop yeah because and you're living in such close you know, there was lots of officers in my case in my situation that mm -hmm. and you when you're living in such close quarters i mean everybody knows uh oh you're frozen <laughs> well yeah i mean in when you're serving that close, I mean, you're, you, everybody knows if there's a problem, everybody, you know, it's, and it's up to the leadership to right. take action on that. And there's, I mean, you, you do everything together. And so there's no way for it not to be known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no accountability. Right. There's no accountability for senior ranking officers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, if I were to screw up, Ben, I would. I mean, they'd have no problem Article 15, oh, yeah. doing an Article 15 on me, yep, counseling me. I mean, I got reprimanded for, for, for not lying. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's like, okay. Yep. You know, in, my, uh, in the final report of my investigation, um, the adjutant, they, they reached out to the adjutant general and asked him, you know, why were you directing to have uh, Sergeant Romero moved. And his, it was like, it was 
one sentence he said, well, she wasn't, she wasn't doing her job. And then he declined to interview. So it's like, hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess that's how it works. I guess if you're a general officer, you can just decline to be interviewed. So it's like, do you get to decline going to jail for committing a crime too? Like, right. just curious. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's insane. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Yeah, absolutely. But that's just that abuse of authority. Mm -hmm. Absolute abuse of authority. You know what I mean? And it's, there's so many, and here's the, here's the troubling, um, the troubling facts, Ben, is that my story is not unique. That's right. You know, when I was going through everything, I thought, I'm like, I was, I, I felt very, uh, I'm like, oh, my story is unique. Like, you know, it involves this, 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 and this. And then now that, you know, this, this last eight months of, uh, you know, since Vanessa went missing, yeah. I've joined forces with so many different organizations mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we have meetings. I mean, I'm on a legislative task force to try to get this bill passed yeah. and, you know, we're all talking, we're all talking and we're all like, you too, yeah. really? You too? I mean, it's, it's, it's so common that it's disgusting. You know, and it's, it's got to change. It's got to change because veterans, we're going to have a higher suicide rate. We're going to continue to have a high suicide rate. We're going to continue to have a high drug and alcohol rate. We're going to have high um, sexual violence. You know, those rates are going to increase. And then guess what? Guess who gets to pay the price? I mean, obviously we do with our lives, but then the American people, it's your tax dollars that are paying for our disability payments. Yep. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to, I'm going to get disability for the rest of my life. Ben. And it's your tax dollars that are going to be paying my disability. I was discharged for PTSD due to hostile work environment. You know what I mean? And it's like, there's, there's uh, victims of uh, survivors of military sexual assault that are receiving disability payments. There's there's a, over 1.5 million veterans receiving disability payments for military sexual trauma. Wow. That's billions of dollars. Those billions of dollars are earmarked every year. Okay, so if that number is just going to keep growing, so. Yeah. I mean, change needs to happen and you are leading the way. There's because, a lot of us leading the way. Yeah. And you continue to stand up for your soldiers. You continue to live with the honor of saying, I'm not leaving anybody behind. You're staying true to your creed, even though your organization has abandoned you, persecuted you, violated you, and tossed you aside as if you were nothing. And all you did the whole time try to take care of your soldiers. That has to change. If anybody is listening to this, who is dealing with suicidal ideation, the link for the suicide hotline is below. Make sure you get the help you need because your pain, there are those who have felt similar pain and you're not alone. And amazing people like this senior NCO is there to get you back up, to help you understand that your voice is important and that there are people out there who want to hear that voice. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be more and more and more and more and more and more vocal and present in the dialogue and the debate about how we serve our country honorably. Please do not take your life over people who have abused you. Live through it. Partner with amazing people like this. And, and rise up and let's make change because you're not alone. Crystal, will you share some resources or information about what's happening now um, to give people some hope? Well, one, you know, one thing I want to talk, uh, touch on as far as, you know, if, if you're feeling suicidal, you know, because I've been there many times, uh, you know, when I was going through my stuff, I was extremely suicidal. You know, there was, um, but if, if we go back to the basics, 
go back to the basics. Think about it. You know, it's like we all have a battle buddy. Okay. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you join the military, you have a battle buddy. And, um, you know, we have, we have many. And so one of the things that I've encouraged, you know, people to do is reach out to your battle buddy. You know what? Because we've all been through the same shit. Yeah. We've all experienced the same um, the same issues in the military. Uh, I know a lot of people are uh, real hesitant to call like the suicide hotline and stuff. Um, and even though that is a great resource, it is. But sometimes talking to to one of your battle buddies yeah. is that's all that's all you need because before you know it, you're laughing. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're laughing. I'm like, can you believe this? Yeah. And, and, and that's what, that's, what's kept me going mm. even now, you know, going through all this. Um, I still, I call up my battle buddies and I'm like, I was like, Hey, are you busy? Or I'll text them and I'll say, Hey, are you busy? Like I'm having a moment yeah. and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Call, you know, and we'll FaceTime. And like I said, it's like, and we'll both, and we'll cry, <laughs> you know, cause it's, it's very frustrating mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's, um, but we're, but we talk each other through it. Yeah. And like I said, and you know, before you know it, you're laughing and yeah. you're, you know, it's like, okay, you're back to, you're back to, okay. Cause at the end of the day, you know what, like if I would have, if I, if I wouldn't, if I would have left this earth, yeah. you know, I would have left a very painful mess behind, you know, and that mess is my kids would have had to have survived that. Yeah. And um, you know, our families have to now carry that pain. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard, you know, it's a hard topic to talk about, but there are resources out there and there's, again, go back to the basics. You're bat the battle buddy system. Right. Um, one of the, um, some of the resources that I would like to talk about is the vet center, the vet center. I don't know if people know about the vet center, but you know, it's, it's part of the VA, but they're not attached to the VA. So, you know, for some service members, you know, just identifying, you know, walking into a military facility gives them anxiety. So there's, there's lots of organizations out there, nonprofits that are, that are um, accessible to veterans. They can even help with, drug and alcohol abuse, any of that, any stuff. And the vet center actually takes active duty also. Mm -hmm. So that's important for people to know and that there's a vet center in, in every state. Okay. So <clears throat> that's, that, that's one of the resources that I am always telling people to use because, because they're connected to the VA, they have like the appropriate funding to get you the services that you need mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry. And it's confidential, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, I think, one of the most important things that um, organizations can offer right now to veterans is confidentiality yeah, because right. the stigma, yeah. you know, the stigma is still there. Even though there's, you know, we, there's posters hanging on the wall saying, oh, no, come see us. We'll help you. We're not there yet. No, we're not. Right. That's right. Um, Crystal. I always end the show, six questions I always run through. First one is, who are you thankful for today? I am thankful for my kids because they, they, have, they have shown me that, um, they've shown me that I, I am their hero and they need, they need me around and I'm thankful for them because, you know, they're like a daily reminder that I, I need to be here. Mm. I've got a job to do, you know, yeah. be a mom and also my mission. So that's what I'm thankful for. All right. Now that we've covered who you're thankful for, what are you thankful for today? I'm thankful that my uh, suicide attempt was unsuccessful and that I'm here today to stand up and to fight for people who 
who are also in that position. How do you fuel the fire within you? I'm sorry? How do you fuel the fire within you? I think you froze. How do I feel the fire within me? Oh man. Um, I think that's probably, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. How do you feel the fire in you, Ben? <laughs> I, feel, I feel it by having these conversations with people who are so honorable that they, that even when it's hard, they stand up for what's right. And, and regardless of what less, what people with less integrity, um, regardless of what they do to them, they keep fighting because that is the solution. And uh, to how many problems is honorable people being the leader and not being cast out. That fuels my fire. He's talking to resilient people like you who give hope to others. What is one? Well, you know what fuels my fire? What's that? Well, I guess I could say that what fuels my fire is this incredible network of people that I've met through this journey. You yeah. know, people like you. Um, uh, there's a young lady out of Florida, Katie Chorback, whom I, when I met her, I just was like, man, she, you're just very, just inspirational. And it's like, yeah, we're going to do, yeah, we are going to fight and let's fight together, nice. you know? Yeah. And meeting, you know, meeting other people that have this, who also have this passion. It's like, we're stronger together. So, awesome. so there's that. Good deal. What is one thing adversity taught you to value? <sighs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, my phone just rang. Um, how does it, how, how does it, I want, can, will, will you answer that question first? Sure. Yep. Uh, one thing that adversity has taught me to value is um, people who don't give up when times get hard. So when we're overwhelmed, when um, we experience really, really troubling things, um, it teaches me to value people who have enough grit and integrity to keep doing what's right, even when it's hard. Um, that's what adversity has taught me to really value is those people who stay in the fight, uh, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard, because there's no, you, those are people that you want to stay connected to because they're trustworthy. Um, and they have that moral fiber that's in them. That's that you can rely on that, is not just talk, but it's action, right. you know? That's what, that's, that's how I view that one. That's how you view it. Well, I guess it goes back to, you know, the, my last answer, you know, and it's, I've, I've met some incredible people who have endured some struggles like, you know, like I have, yeah. and uh, just building each other up and working together, you know, for the greater good, you yeah. know, for positive change, for long overdue change. Yeah. So, um, and just, just knowing them, you know, like when I met, um, when I went to DC for the Vanessa Guillen uh, in June, when, you know, when they presented the bill to the president, uh, I took my daughter with me. My she's eighteen, and uh, how we have to fight. We have to stand up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, you know, my daughter to meet other women and men mm -hmm. who have been through hell. And look, like we're all here together, you know. So that's mm -hmm. that would be my answer. <laughs> Excellent. What are you doing today? You may have never thought you could. I never thought, um, I never, I, I never thought I'd be an activist. 
You know, I, I became an activist the day Vanessa Guillen went missing. And that's something I never thought I'd do because, um, you know, now it's getting to, now it's getting like, you know, politically involved, right? Because you need Congress to sign off on these things. So, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm jumping into the, the players that I'd be doing that. And what will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? Uh, tomorrow? Um, I guess just, I'm going to keep pushing forward. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep speaking out and I'm not going to be concerned about what, you know, what people think of my past, like, Oh, you know, cause you know, there's this, this, uh, you know, my, my leadership did a lot to discredit me. So when people see me, they're like, Oh, there's that crazy, uh, NCO that got kicked out cause she was crazy. <laughs> so this crazy NCO is going to keep showing up. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to keep showing up. Love it. Awesome. How can people learn more about you, your work and these issues that we've been talking about today? So I moderate a page on Facebook. It's uh, justice for Vanessa Guillen. And it's uh, the page was created by Invisible Combat. They're a nonprofit organization. Uh, there's two ladies um, that run it, two awesome ladies that run it, uh, the CEO and the COO, uh, D. James and, um, and, and Kimberly. They're phenomenal women. So um, that's where you can find me. I'm the moderator for that page, and it's uh, justice, justice for Vanessa Guillen. And also, I'm on Instagram. My Instagram is Travels for Chocolate. <laughs> and that's where you can find me. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Crystal, thank you so much for your service, uh, for your continued service, even today, to make our world a finer place. Our fallen deserve that. And, uh, and our living deserve that. And so I just uh, am very grateful for your time here today and excited to see what kind of world you create. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for this. Um, when I found your podcast on Facebook, I was, I was right away. I was like, this is phenomenal. This is great. I absolutely love what you're doing. I love it. I do. I, I'm always, you know, I'll, I'll forever share your stuff because you are, you're giving people hope. You're giving people hope. You're giving people something to to hold on to, you know. And you're you're letting them know that they're not alone. And um, I think the more people hear that, the more we can start to heal as a nation. So get up, nation. Get up, get up, nation. <laughs> get up.